Hey, good morning. Thank you all for coming at such an early hour. Today I would like to talk to you about uh, zero downtime PostgreSQL upgrades. Um, a few words about me. I'm Alex. Uh, I work as a database reliability engineer at GitLab for uh, a bit over two years right now. The eight years before, I worked at a PostgreSQL and open source consulting company. And overall, I use PostgreSQL since the mid-2000s, and uh, I'm into Linux and open source since the end of the 90s. Yeah, today I would like to talk, to you, to talk with you about how we execute PostgreSQL major upgrades at GitLab with zero downtime. Uh, and I would like to do so by answering a few questions. Um, first one, PostgreSQL upgrades. How do they work, and, and why are they hard? So why do we need to talk about them? How did we perform upgrades in the past? Why did we need to improve on that? And uh, yeah, how we improved on it. First, a little thing about my, my clickbait title. Uh, what is zero downtime? For me, it means all services need to stay available to the end user. But it's, it's not a, a Boolean. It's not a true or false, because each service and each action in the service has a certain uh, response time. If a user clicks a button, the result is not instantaneous. If you have a great snappy application, it maybe feels instantaneous to the user, but it's not. Yeah, it may take 100 milliseconds, um, but it's, it's not a Boolean. You can't say it's zero, zero or not, because it's, it's never zero. There's always, always a latency. Uh, and there are different, different methods to define what latency is uh, acceptable and what's toleratable. Uh, what we at GitLab use, it's called the AppDAX. It's the Application Performance Index. It's an open standard on how to calculate that. Uh, you can, if you're super interested, you can read the Wikipedia page. Uh, but summed up, you're looking at uh, all of your requests or uh, um, representable sample of your requests and you define thresholds. So what's a satisfactory uh, result? So the user clicks a button and it feels snappy and instantaneous. That makes the user happy. That's the satisfactory um, limit. If the user clicks a button and it takes a little while and it's not feeling snappy, it's feeling like walking to a tar pit, but it's still like usable, that's toleratable. And if the user gets really annoyed and maybe retries the action, that's frustrating. You have to define these thresholds for all, all your services or your actions. And then with this information, you can calculate um, the, the performance index. And that we have for all our services uh, in order to have a single metric uh, where, where we can, can uh, estimate the user experience from. Well, we need this later or to see uh, if we improved on our user experience. Okay, why are PostgreSQL major upgrades hard? Um, there are different kinds of services. You have stateless services like application servers. Uh, upgrading them is pretty easy. You can upgrade a PG Bouncer uh, without any, any notice with, with much effort because it's a stateless service. Uh, and even if you have a stateful service like PostgreSQL, if you are doing a minor version upgrade, you can do it relatively nice as well because all the state, all the heap files stay the same. But if you're doing a major version upgrade, the heap files do not stay the same. They normally don't have to be rewritten entirely, but their structure and uh, metadata that has to change. And if you're having a large database, uh, we, we normally at GitLab, we have 20 to 40 terabyte databases. Uh, now we have more 20, data, 20 terabyte databases and not one single anymore. But still, um, if you have relatively large databases, this takes time and consideration. There are different methods. The default method and standard one, for example, if you are using the um, official Debian packages, uh, they come with PostgreSQL, uh, with, with PostgreSQL common, and there are cluster management tools like PG Upgrade Cluster, and that's the default method there as well. Um, and it's, it has its pros and cons, uh, but I go through it to, to show you why it's uh, not, not the ideal thing for us. The first thing you have to do is you, put, you have to put your database in a read-only mode because all changes you would do to the database during the upgrade process will be lost, so you would have data loss. Um, yeah, so you start out with putting the database in read-only mode, and then you can extract the data in a logical format uh, with the tool pgdump or pgdump all. Um, in reality, you would not use SQL at the output format. You would use a slightly optimized internal format, but for the sake of the... Um, the talk, we, we just say SQL, and the, um, 
general performance is not, not so much different. So you have to take all your data, which is stored in binary format, you have to transfer it to a logical format, then you have to either write it to disk or directly transfer it to a new server. Both have pro and cons. If you write it directly to disk, you can use parallelization. If you are streaming it to a new server, you can't do that, or you have to manually, uh, manually build parallelization in it or use a special tool. And then on the new server, you have to read this logical, uh, logical data and you have to put it in the internal binary format again. So both are quite compute intensive uh, operations and take quite some time. Um, I guess for our database, the dump takes like 24 hours. And then after you have imported all the data in your new nice and shiny cluster, uh, you have to recreate all the helping structures because this is only transferring the raw data. You have no indexes, nothing around your data. So it's, it's a nice thing if you have a small database or if you have a 9 to 5 business and you don't work at night, you don't work on the weekend. Uh, it's a really safe option. And if you have the, the possibility to take a large downtime without a major problem for your, for your organization, that's the way to go. Uh, it's uh, reliable, it's easy, and you start out with freshly nice organized uh, ta uh, tables. You have fresh indexes, no bloat. Uh, and one really important thing, when you export and import your complete data, uh, you are pretty sure it's, uh, it's sane because everything gets parsed. Yeah, if this fulfills your need, um, you don't have to listen too closely to the other slides. I would go with this one. The next upgrade method uh, is, a, is a bit more sophisticated. It uses the tool PG Upgrade, also a recommended method. Uh, and this, one, this tool gets a new release with each PostgreSQL release, and it knows which parts of the heap data changes and can rewrite your data on disk. Yeah? But this first step still stays the same. Um, for PG Upgrade, you have to take your database down completely. If you would like to stay operational in a read-only mode, you can easily do that. You have, just have to create a standby, uh, which you can, can use in read-only operation, uh, because if you would allow write traffic to this, uh, to this machine, you would lose all the, the user input or the user data during the upgrade, so only read-only is possible. And then you start PG upgrade on your, on your machine, uh, going through all the heap files and rewriting where it is necessary. It's reasonable fast, it's reasonable safe. Yeah, it's, it's not validating all your data, it's not going through all your data and checking if it's, if it's uh, sane and if it's... Uh, for example, when you, when you would do the PG dump and you are dumping a, a field that you can validate, like a JSON field, it gets dumped and validated and on an input it gets validated again so you would, you would notice if it's corrupted. Uh, here you don't, don't have that side effect. It's quite simple. Um, but one thing uh, we noticed in the past, um, it could be that you have a performance degra degradation after an upgrade. Um, and therefore, we had a, a process, I, I will show that uh, in later slides, where after the upgrade, we had to, to check our regression tests uh, for the database. So it can take a significant downtime if, you, if you're using this approach and you have additional checks and balances you have to do to your system before you can, can allow user traffic on it again. But again, if this method fulfills your need, you can listen to the other slides, but I would stick to that. Yeah, how, how did we do the upgrades in the past? We used the method I just showed, PG, uh, PG upgrade. We created a, a second cluster from the backup. We synced the cluster, so now we have two, two carbon copy clusters. And uh, we put GitLab into maintenance mode, and that's the problem, the whole red block is uh, performed with, with downtime, so we took like uh, half a Saturday of downtime for this. We used PG upgrade on the primary to upgrade the data structure there. This is something that took us before like an hour, the, the PG upgrade run. Nowadays, uh, with the optimizations, uh, it would take like half an hour, 20 minutes, half an hour. And then we recreated from the upgraded, uh, upgraded machine, we would recreate all standbys. And now comes the, the really, really uh, downtime prone thing. We needed to run a full regression and QA test on the application in order to assure 
uh, that the uh, new database is capable of handling our load. A and why did we do that? The problem is if you are allowing user traffic back to your database directly uh, and you encounter a problem you cannot fix easily, you, you are in a really bad situation because now you would have to decide, do I stick with the not performing application or am I willing to sacrifice all the user data we got during the period we already uh, allowed live traffic on the database. So business requirement was that we are uh, pretty sure the database uh, and our whole setup is performing uh, to our needs. And so this really, really increased the downtime period. Uh, but as mentioned before, if, if you are okay to take a downtime period or you don't have direct user, user changes to your database, this method might be, might be still to, totally valid for your, your use case. So why, why did we need to improve? Yeah, it was a, a large inconvenience for our users and customers. Uh, we did that on the weekends, but unfortunately uh, we have uh, fortunately, we have users all around the world, and some of them are corporate users that only work mostly during their current nine to five times on, on work weeks. But we have a lot of, of users who like to, to work on weekends as well. So taking, taking off uh, our application for half a Saturday is, is completely unacceptable. Uh, and over, even, even if we were not doing a, a PostgreSQL upgrade every year, but every second year, uh, this single maintenance thing was responsible for the majority of our, our downtime. So uh, that was definitely a pain. Uh, and it was such a pain that PostgreSQL upgrades were avoided for they were so hurtful. So at the beginning of this year, we were still running PG12, for example. Uh, yeah. Uh, and how, how can you improve on that? Uh, how can you reduce the, the user impact? Uh, and like the first logical thing you could optimize, you could take the current process and just optimize it to reduce downtime. Yeah, as I mentioned, the biggest loss we had were due to the, or the biggest downtime component was the, the excessive QA and regression tests. And you could optimize those tests that they are faster, you can make them shorter, or you can skip them entirely and, and uh, have somewhat of a YOLO attitude to it. But uh, as mentioned before, that was a business requirement to do it not, uh, not this way. Um, so we looked into a totally different method, which now with the cool new developments in PostgreSQL was available. Uh, and that is to use logical replication to upgrade asynchronously so that we had, can do all the, the time consuming steps of the upgrade while being still uh, in full operation mode. And that's what we did and that's what I'm walking you through. Um, I will explain l upgrade in lo uh, with logical application uh, a bit abstracted way, and then I will go through the steps we actually did. So first of all, we start out with our current database cluster. Uh, in reality, it's one primary and eight standbys around that, and our application talking to the cluster. Then we are creating a new one um, from, from disk snapshot, because that's the fastest method for us. Um, and we, we brought them in sync during the standard uh, physical replication. So we start out with two identical clusters, carbon copies. One is the, the main one used by the application, and one is the one we utilize for the upgrade. The next thing is we cut the replication, um, and now the, the cluster is a snapshot of the, the current, current production. The, the second cluster is a snapshot of the current production cluster somewhat in the past. We perform our upgrade on it, have all time in the world for this. Uh, and after the cluster is upgraded, we have all the time in the world to do checks and balances on it as well. And then after the, the upgrade, we can take our time to resync it. And that's where logical replication comes into play. Because with physical replication, you can only, only replicate from, from the same major version of PostgreSQL to the same way, major version. You cannot replicate from one version to another, or you can't replicate to a system that uses a different libc library, or you shouldn't. Um, and that's, that's the game, game changer here, that we are able to do that. Yeah, and after the, um, the cluster got into sync with the, the new cluster, got into sync with the old one, you can pick a time which is uh, convenient for you to do the switch over. This part, of course, causes a slight downtime because you have to, to, to switch all the, um, all the connections from one to the other, but I, I will show you how we did it and uh, what the actual user impact was, or if there was any. 
So logical replication. Why is not everybody using it for every upgrade? And at the beginning of the talk, I told you, if pgdump works for you, use it. If pgupgrade without bells and whistles works for you, use it. And the thing is, logical replication comes with some catches. The first is, you cannot replicate schema and DDL. So all the DDL and all the schema is not replicated. Uh, you have to find a way around that. Uh, and by the way, I will, will talk about all of the four for bullet points here in a bit detail right after this, this uh, index slide. Next thing is sequences are not replicated, but they are heavily used in PostgreSQL. And each table needs a replication identica, uh, identity, uh, unless you can, cannot use it. And the, fourth, uh, but not, the last but not least point, it's much more complex and prone to human error. Yeah, DDL is not replicated. That means you, you cannot start with an empty database and just logically replicate into it. You have to start with at least the schema. For us, it was not such a big problem because, uh, yeah, as mentioned, we have a 20 terabyte, data, 20 terabyte database. We do not want to stream the full 20 terabytes through logical replication. That's quite inefficient, uh, quite, quite the same as transferring all your data to SQL. So we just started with a really fresh, just a few minute old uh, disk snapshot and use that as a starting point so we do not have to replicate the schema and a lot of the historical data uh, also was not needed to be replicated. Schema changes. Yeah, that's a bit up to you. You have to look at your application. Um, oh, yeah. I have a slide on that. Uh, for schema changes, you have to look at your application. Does your application schema changes on its own? For us, it's quite good. Uh, we do schema changes, for example, we do partitioning, we create new, new partitions of tables and things like that, um, but we are not doing that uh, as a result of a user interaction, so there's no user clicking a button and GitLab in the background decides, oh, now would be a good time to create a new partition. No, we have uh, something called background jobs for that, and uh, there's a flag in GitLab where you can just disable these background jobs, and we are doing right that. When our upgrade window starts, we are disabling all the background jobs, uh, which has for us another benefit, also there are maintenance jobs, like explicitly calling analyze, vacuum for things, or calling re-indexes on certain indexes that are prone to, to bloat. Uh, and all these jobs I do not want to have during the upgrade, for they will increase load and write, of, uh, write a headlock write on the database. So we just deactivate all these jobs at the beginning of the upgrade uh, window, and we are fine with that. Sequences, that, that's kind of a bummer. Post sequences are heavily used in PostgreSQL. If you are using a, a serial field, or for the MySQL users, you may that, know that as auto-increment, uh, where you want to have just a new unique ID, preferably in a small in integer uh, for, for a primary key. It's, it's used uh, often. You need something called sequences. A sequence is something in PostgreSQL that gives you uh, a unique number, normally as an increment of one. Um, from a 64-bit integer uh, normally, if you're using big serial. Yeah, and this cannot be replicated, which on its own is a really big problem, <clears throat> because you would lose uh, the information which of the, the IDs are already used, and you can, could get uh, duplication problems. For us, the solution seems a bit like a workaround and was a bit hacky, but I'm, uh, it worked quite well for us. Uh, prior to the upgrade, we looked at our, our sequences and we uh, selected the information at which point each sequence was. So we got the, the integer uh, value at which point the sequence was. And then a week later, we looked again, how did the sequences evolve? How many IDs did each sequence produce uh, during one week? Um, and we defined a threshold, how many sequences we, have to, we could m in max use during the upgrade. That's important because when we start with the new cluster and when we um, switch it to logical replication, it will no longer receive the information how many sequence numbers have been used on the primary cluster. Yeah? And we define it a, a gigantic threshold of one million because that's something we would use normally more in a week than in a day or in a half day. Uh, but still, one million is not, not a big part of a 64-bit integer, so we, we weren't afraid to just uh, increase the sequence count on the new machines by one million. So we would waste up to one million IDs from the integer space, uh, but we made sure that we have no collision there. Um, 
is there somebody who would like me to explain it again because I, I totally screwed up explaining the problem and the solution? Yeah, the, the, the problem is um, you get this. Okay, the solution is um, when, you, when you start the new cluster, when you bring the new cluster uh, in sync with logical replications, uh, you no longer get the, uh, the information which sequences are generated on the primary. But they are generated in sequence. So if your current counter is like 1 million, they will give out 1 million, 1, 1 million, 2, 1 million, 3. Um, and we defined uh, a, a large buffer on how many sequences could be generated in a week. And we used this to in increment the new cluster. So the new cluster would start out not at 1 million, but at 2 million. Because for the usage as a primary key, it does not matter if they are really in sequence. It only matters that they are unique. Is that awesome? Thank you. So yeah, it's a really relatively simple workaround. You just find out what's a good value, and on your uh, target cluster, on the new one, you just increase increase the sequence by this value. Replication identity. Each each table needs either of these these three things. It needs a primary key. Then you are good. Uh, another unique key which identifies each row of a table, or you have to to fully track the full, full rows, so you are able to, to know when a row changes and you have to, to replicate it to the, uh, to the new system. And the last one is, is quite performance intensive. And our solution was quite simple. We had to do nothing because, uh, fortunately, all our tables have primary keys. So uh, if you don't, you have to look into what, what you have to do. But having primary keys is quite cool anyways. Yeah, complexity. Last but not least, complexity. Um, the logical replication method is quite complex. Uh, I oversimplified in the, the first overview, but there are a lot of, lot of things that can, can go wrong. You might have realized that when I explained the sequence problem. Uh, so it's quite prone to human error, and uh, it's highly, highly advised to automate all your steps so, so that you do them reliable and, and do not uh, introduce new tiny human errors. And our solution to that uh, is, as you might expect, we did a complete orchestration. So all actions that would be, would, or all actions we could automate with Ansible, we did. And everything we couldn't easily automate with Ansible, uh, we put in a, in a uh, quite tedious uh, change, change request uh, process, which we can execute uh, reliable. And uh, yeah, the most important thing is excessive testing. Yeah? When something hurts, you might need to do it more often until it's no longer hurting you. Uh, and for many things, uh, if they hurt much, uh, you have to do it uh, a lot of times until it's not hurting so much anymore. Uh, and we did a lot of intense testing. Uh, we have three environments, a benchmarking environment, uh, a staging environment, and production. So we could play around in, in benchmarking. We could, after we had a process, we could iterate on it in, in staging. But the cool thing here with this is, uh, you can do a lot of tests in production as well, because until the switchover, you can do all tests in production if you like, because you are creating a new cluster, you are making it sync from the old one, and if you are doing it somewhat, somewhat safely, you can do it safe in production without impacting your users. So that's a really good one. We tested it in production, um, which also gave us great metrics on how, how the timing is for different things, um, and we could, could, could use the production load uh, as, an actual, uh, as an actual factor to see how much it will take to, for the new cluster to catch up and things like that. Uh, and yeah, as a little spoiler, the whole automation and also our, our change request is, uh, issue template uh, is uh, freely available now. I was able to free it up uh, last week, so I will put the links at the end. So if you're really interested, you can go through all of this in detail. Yeah. Now I will go a bit through our improved process. You saw the old one before with the large downtime. And you might remember this picture from before. Our first step is to prepare a new environment. And uh, I apologize a bit, the new graphs are not looking as nice. They are directly from our change request issue and they are generated by code. Uh, we have this feature in GitLab called Mermaid, or it's a, a markup language where you can uh, define different, different graphs in, in code, 
uh, in this, this case, it's a, a flowchart, and it's directly generated from, from um, the Markdown document, which is our change request, so I just screen screenshotted them. Uh, but therefore, you can, can nicely uh, save your graphs in Git and iterate of them with your distributed team. Yeah, first step, we, we need to create a new environment. Uh, in our case, um, we create a new cluster from, from the snapshots, and uh, from now on, we are calling the old cluster source and the new cluster target, because we are streaming data from source to target. We attach the new target cluster as a standby-only cluster to the source. That means we have our, our main cluster, we have the target cluster, and it only consists of standbys. We have a standby leader that replicates the data from the primary cluster and then distributes it to all the standbys. Then comes the next step, the actual upgrade, which already is a bit more complex uh, than in, in the, the overview. First thing we needed to deactivate our normal automation. We have Chef running, so our machines are all provisioned by Chef. Um, and Chef is quite good at uh, configuring a machine and keeping it in this state, but uh, as, as at least as how we Chef use, it's not good into helping you transform a machine from one state to another or orchestrate that on multiple machines at the same time. So we are deactivating Chef, and as mentioned before, the orchestration for the upgrade we, we wrote in, um, in Ansible. We perform, uh, we cleanly shut down the target cluster, the new one, and on the source cluster, we create a replication slot and a publication for, the, for all tables. That means now the source cluster, the current operation cluster, remembers at which point the target cluster is and saves all the, the, or keeps track of all the logical changes to the data so the target cluster can later pull them from the source cluster. And for that, we need to remember the LSN, the logical sequence number. That's the point in time where we are hooking in again. Now we can start up our target cluster again. And uh, it needs to, now it was down for some time, small amount of time, but it still needs to catch up to the, uh, it needs, still needs to catch up to the uh, source cluster again. And we are doing this still using physical replication. Um, and now is the time where we can perform the actual upgrade. That means we are running PG upgrade on this cluster. That's the upgrade, but that's actually the, the most uninteresting part. You're, you're running PG upgrade, and 20 minutes later, 30 minutes later, it's, it's finished. But now we have one upgraded primary and uh, a lot of no longer, no, not upgraded standbys. Uh, and we could now take a snapshot from the primary and reprovision all the uh, standbys from this, this snapshot. But this was t would take not, not an hour or so, but significant time. Uh, and we use rsync. rsync is a synchronization tool. The older, older people in the audience might remember using it for a lot of things. Uh, I, I definitely do. Uh, and you can use rsync to synchronize your data, and it's only, only synchronizing the files uh, that have changed, and only looking at the files that have changed. Uh, but at this point, I would point out, if you're using rsync, make sure you're reading the docs and you're using the correct uh, parameters, because uh, if you're using the wrong ones, for example, uh, if you are telling rsync to only, only uh, look at the time a file has changed, uh, it can be that the... the, the um, the checks are not perfect. For example, it's not, not looking up to the millisecond, but only to, to a second ch uh, change, and you could miss a file that has been changed. Uh, yeah, just, just double check that you are using the correct parameters for rsync. Uh, you could also look in our automation to, lo to see which parameters we use. Okay, I am not going through the parameters. We now have the primary upgraded, we used rsync to, to, to bring all these changes to all the standbys, so we have our target cluster upgraded to a new PostgreSQL major version. And now we need to let it catch up to the current production stand, because in the whole time we, we did this, uh, users were working on GitLab, creating issues, doing stuff, uh, and we need to get these changes to our new cluster. After uh, we ensured that the cluster has a small replication lag, so all changes are replicated and it's keeping up to the current uh, current current duration, uh, we can continue. 
And the next step is to prepare the switch over. Now we have primary cluster, we have the, uh, the source cluster, we have the target cluster, target cluster has a new version, and they are in sync and replicating. Um, now we have to prepare for the future operation, because as mentioned, we have Chef, and Chef is good at keeping things as they, they are. Um, and we have new roles that are able to, to maintain a new PostgreSQL version. So now we are, we are changing in our configuration that the, the target cluster uh, is no longer, in our case, PG12 cluster, but it's a PG14 cluster. And uh, we run Chef now to see if it causes any um, unwanted side effects uh, at a, as early stage as possible. Uh, and in the, during the testing cycle, we had, had to adjust a few things here uh, to make that work, which is, um, which is a domain, domain thing at, at our place. So if you're not, not using this automation, uh, you might, might not enc uh, encounter that. But this was, was a cause of error, so, so we did that quite, uh, quite intensely and tested it a lot. We make sure Chef finishes and uh, did not cause any, any unwanted side effect, and now we are disabling it again for the next steps of the upgrade. Um, one thing that's not explicit listed, uh, explicitly listed here, but you will find in the change request, multiple engineers will have open multiple dashboards uh, and live, live viewing uh, key metrics of the system. And here's a special point where everybody agrees that the metrics they are, they are monitoring are uh, way, uh, in, in the given boundaries. And now comes the interesting part, the switchover. So we have the old database, uh, we have this, the source database, we have the target database, and now we need to switch, um, to switch the application to no longer use the, the source, but to use the target. And in my uh, oversimplified overview, it was just a simple step. For us, uh, it was much, much, more of a, much more work. We have started by using the uh, target clusters standbys as standbys for, pro for the production load. So we uh, put into our load balancer, um, at first just one standby from the target cluster, put it in the load balancer, and now it was already serving uh, read-only read -only traffic for our customers. And then you can nicely see, if you're comparing all the standbys, because they should, should get an equal amount of, of queries, you can already see, is this standby performing kind of like all the other ones, or is it performing significantly worse or better? Uh, and after, after the standby is, is in, the, in the loop for 15 minutes, and we watch the metrics, and we are quite, quite happy how it performs, we put 50% of all the standbys, of all the target cluster standbys in the load balancer. So now at this point, around 50% uh, of, um, of the target cluster standbys get production load. We again check the, check the metrics if they are behaving as expected. If so, we put all standbys of the target cluster in the load balancer. So now in our load balancing, we have all standbys of the, the source cluster and all standbys of the target cluster. And then we come to, to this point, which says redirect read only to target cluster. Um, and in, in reality, that means uh, that we are also removing all of the source uh, nodes from the, target, from the load balancing. So uh, the load balancer will now only redirect read only queries to the target cluster standbys, and nothing is directed to the, to the source cluster anymore and to the source cluster standby anymore. All write queries are still coming to the primary of the source cluster because it's the only, only uh, it's the cur current, cur uh, current primary, it is the current primary. And now the majority of, of uh, read load is served by our new target cluster, and that's the point where I give the mic to the uh, quality engineering team, and they can perform their excessive QA tests. This takes up to multiple hours, um, but it's not a big problem because our application run, keeps running. There's no, at this point, no, no user impact whatsoever. Um, and because m the majority of traffic is served by our new cluster, we are quite sure that the cluster is able to handle the current, current production load and the QA test at the same time. So if this works, we are quite, quite certain we have a... Um, 
we have a high le high level um, of understanding that that the cluster will keep up with production load. And in the past, this this was the step where we had to to cancel our upgrade the most. Yeah, if you might you might remember at the beginning I said we you could test every step until the actual step over in production, and we did multiple times. Um, we needed to make improvements to our process, we needed to make improvements to our tools, and we needed especially improvements in our QA tests, because they, they were so tight uh, due to the uh, double replication, because if a write query comes to the, comes to the uh, primary of the source cluster, and then it's replicated to the standby leader of the target cluster, and then it's replicated to the standbys, and this uh, increased replication lag caused our quality tests to fail. Uh, sorry, I can't read the first number. Oh, thank you. Uh, this caused our quality tests to fail, uh, and therefore we had to cancel the upgrade and uh, improve our quality tests that they are able to, to uh, still work with a slightly increased replication load. Yeah, and if uh, all quality, the quality team gave the thumbs up that everything works as expected, performance parameters are, are in line, um, we can switch over. And now the switch over is, is just redirecting the right traffic also to the, to the target cluster, because everything else is already there. And now comes the post step. After, after the switch over, where the right traffic is switched over as well, uh, we, we now have to, to, switch, have to check um, all metrics, because the problem is this step is the point of no return. After this step, we cannot go back because everything that's written to the new cluster stays on the new cluster. With this method, we don't have, have any, any means of bringing the changes that have been done by our users to the new environment back to the old. So if you want to go back after this step, you have to decide that you want to lose everything your users did uh, after the switch over. So that's why we were so, so uh, finicky about uh, deciding if the new cluster is now worthy to switch on it. So you, you see that whenever one of our, our uh, checks fails here, we cannot go back. In the previous slide, whenever anything would fail, we would just roll back and nobody would notice. But at that point, if anything fails, we have to fix it. Uh, we kept a lot of engineers in the call to fix anything that would happen. Uh, luckily, there was, was during the live upgrades not, nothing, nothing intense to do. Um, yeah. Then we re-enable our normal automation again. We already checked before that it does not have side effects. We enable it again. And then the cluster uh, is monitored for quite some time if it's operated, operated, uh, operating normally. Uh, and if it is success, the main upgrade finished. Uh, in reality, we have some additional jobs, like for example, with the, last, uh, with the upgrade to PostgreSQL 14, there are some improvements on B3 indexes, and you can only utilize these improvements if you are recreating your indexes. Uh, so we had some post-upgrade steps where we would recreate indexes as well, or some of the improvements. And now the question, did we improve? You, I, I bring that back to you. We started out with a process where we had like eight hours of downtime. Um, and now the question, did we improve? Uh, I showed you this uh, app index before, the application performance index. And we have that for each service. For example, this one shows the application performance index uh, for the web service. And um, I'm pretty sure you can't see the scale. But here is uh, nine, here is 19, starts 99 percent. So the whole the whole graph looks at the, the top one percent, and this is the normal noise. So there are normal events during the day which uh, drop the updex, which uh, that means the uh, request time, the time a user action takes, is increased. That can happen due to high load, background jobs like auto vacuum taking too much logs, things like that. And here you can see the window. Uh, where we did the switch over. So you can clearly see we decreased our, perform our uh, application performance a bit here, but it's much lower than the normal noise you would see during the day. Um, here you see the 9th of September, 8th of September, 7th, 6th. So during the work week, week this, the normal operation, the normal, normal spikes are much higher 
than the upgrade spike. But you also see on the weekends we not have so much load, so on the, on the weekends uh, the performance stays quite quite same. But this is measurable but not noticeable um, in a general. So it could be that there is a single user uh, which uh, clicked the button and it did not work and then he clicked it again, but the percentage of um, of, of actions that failed or took too long is so small that it's less than the normal noise level. This is the same metric for our API. So some use, uh, most users use the, the web interface, but uh, also you can use uh, our API to, to automate whatever you like. Uh, and we are measuring therefore as well. And you see the API is more used on the weekend actually. It has a bit more, bit more noise, but still our upgrade uh, was way less than the normal work week noise. And last but not least, that is our Git service. Um, you could automate in your CI CD that, you, that, you, that you're pulling repos, et cetera. Uh, and here as well, weekend has not so much use as the work. And the decrease in performance uh, during the upgrade was less than the normal noise during a week, uh, work week. Yeah, um, now, now the question is, we have, uh, a pro we have a process that improved quite, quite a lot for us, but can we improve it further? Uh, and yes, we can do, I already spoiled that a bit. Uh, we were really unhappy with this fix forward approach here because after the upgrade, we have no choice into fixing all problems we encounter because we can't go back. Um, and there's something you can improve on, and it's, it's this part, um, because once you utilize logical replication, you can replicate from your old cluster, uh, from your new cluster to the old one again, uh, called reverse replication. So you have to set up your new cluster as the source and your old cluster at the target. Uh, and we already did experiment with that during, during the upgrade. So we actually uh, configured, uh, made this configuration and streamed from the new cluster to the old one. Um, but it was a recently added change, so we did not change the process in order to utilize it in a, in a, in a failure event. Uh, but we already tried it out to benchmark the performance and timing, uh, and that worked quite well. And for our next upgrade, we will uh, use that, and we will change the process that we do not have to fix forward, but if you encounter a larger problem here, we can go back to our, uh, to our previous cluster, to our old version, without losing a single user transaction. Yeah. Uh, and as mentioned before, um, I tried to, to uh, open everything um, I just showed you. You find here some information about GitLab in general. You find our handbook. Uh, if you don't know what the GitLab handbook is, maybe super interesting. Uh, it de defines us as a company, how we work. Uh, and it's a great, great thing to read into if you want to know how life at GitLab is before joining, for example. Uh, there's some information about our relation data databases. There is here the playbooks, which we use for the whole orchestration. So you can download that. There's not a nice open source license added at the moment, uh, but everything, the source is available, so you can, uh, can at least read through it completely. Uh, and at this point, I would like Postgres AI. They helped us to develop and test uh, the automation. That was quite nice. Um, you will find the slide deck just after I left the, the stage. I will upload the current, current slides uh, on the PGConf.eu's website. And when you're grabbing the slides, please feel free to leave me some feedback. Uh, there's also a comment section, so if you want to say something I can improve on, please feel free to put it in the, in the text and still rate me good. Um, <laughs> and you can find some information about me as well. Uh, if you are really like to dig into stuff, um, we are quite transparent at GitLab, so you can find, uh, and yeah, we are using GitLab, the software, to organize GitLab, the company, so you, we are using our project management features to, to organize our work. You can find the main epic of the upgrade uh, here. Um, I put the full link in, and under this you find the epics for the different steps, so you can completely go through our thought process and how we develop the process, if you are, have some time to look into that. And the screenshots of the flowchart you will find uh, here. I put the full link in uh, as well. There you can find the source for the flowcharts. Yeah, uh, if you have any question, you can ask me right now after I stop talking. You can approach me during the event, or if something comes to your mind later, feel free to catch up with me. And thank you. All right. Uh, just a really, really simple why 14. Sorry? 
why PG 14 rather than 15? Yeah, great thing. We have a long we have a long term planning on when to support which version. And if you want to read up, I made some some suggestions to to uh, change it a bit. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, we are quite conservative on that. No, no specific reason. Just no, uh, no specific reason. We have we have a long time planning. Uh, we have a long time planning. Um, there, there's a, a, a spreadsheet one to use, and uh, we would like to, to use. Uh, we would like to support only a small number of major versions for the for the product. So. Yeah. Uh, hi. Thank you for the, for the talk. Uh, I have a question about the sequences. You mentioned that um, it's not supported, like logical replication of sequences. There is currently work ongoing on that. But my question is like, have you considered using a type of a generator? I, I wouldn't say sequence, but a, a generator that actually doesn't require rep replication. I mean, like uh, instead of using auto incrementing value using something like UID or, or something like that, because that would mean you do not need actually to, you know, synchronize the, uh, the state, right? So have you considered that and what were the reasons why not to use that? Yeah, I guess we talked briefly about that. Um, so we briefly talked about if we can use something else than a, se than a sequence, you could use a unique ID, uh, unique ID, but that's a lot of work and would require a lot of change to the application. And um, the solution we choose, we didn't need any support by our application developers, and we didn't have to impose a change on, on millions of users. Um, so this, this seemed, even if it looks a bit hacky, it seemed like the, the most simple solution to us, the most boring one. Alex. Oh. Um, thank you. Very interesting presentation. There was one, one bit which slightly surprised me, and I didn't completely understand. So, You've got your, you've upgraded your, uh, you have a logical replication to your new PG-14, and you start asking to, was it some of the old re read-only replicas? So, I mean, I'm imagining that you had 10, you took two or three, and you start pushing some of the load, but you're doing, I would assume, just in my head, you would build new machines, but you did R-sync to those? That was the bit I didn't quite follow why you were using rsync after doing the, setting up the new logical replica with PG14. Okay, uh, I guess I get your question. Your question is why do we need to use rsync? Because the thing is, you we upgraded the pr the not pr primary is the wrong word. Uh, it was called the standby leader before, then it was technically promoted, and then we upgraded it, and now we have the upgraded primary. And we have a lot of standbys that still run the old version. And you cannot just run the upgrade on all machines. You have to, because they are not 100% identical, so you would normally have to, to take a backup from the primary and recreate all the standbys. And we speed up the process by using Async, because you can't, cannot upgrade the standbys on their own. Uh, OK, yeah, I'm getting it now. Thanks. All right, time for maybe two more questions. All right. Alex, thank you so much for your time. Thank you all for having me.